Revelation chapter number 1. If you're visiting with us this morning, we're glad to see you. Thank you for taking time to be here. I would like to preach a simple message this morning, um, simply titled, Three Things Christ Has Done For You. Three Things Christ Has Done For You. Of course, we know there's many things he's done, and I'm just going to look at three of them today. But I'd like to start here in Revelation chapter 1. Let's read verses 4 through 6. The Bible says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the day. Thank you for the songs. Thank you, Lord, for the beautiful weather. We'd like like to take our attention now, Lord, and turn it to your word. We believe and know, according to the scripture, that this is the word which is able to build us up and to give us an inheritance among all them that are sanctified by faith that's in Christ Jesus. So I pray you will take it now, mix it with faith, and help us to receive it with humility. Um, And I pray, Lord, if there's someone here this morning that is not saved, that today would be an understanding day. Today would be a day of understanding who Christ is and what he did for them in in a greater way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God gave us his word with intentional design. Uh, He he created the world with intentional design, but he gave us the Bible with intentional design. He put things in order. What I'd like to say is, as you've read your Bible, you probably noticed that there'll be some verses where a word is mentioned, and alongside that word, another word is mentioned also. And you'll find that again and again in Scripture, where two things will go together. I'd like to just consider briefly, uh, and this is not the main thrust of the message, but just to give you an example of what I'm talking about. Consider with me the words mercy and truth. All right, so these words do go briefly together. Number one, and this is just four references. There's actually many more. Mercy and truth is part of God's character. It's part of who he is. Amen. And aren't you thankful for that? He showed his mercy to you when you got saved. You did not receive the judgment that you deserved for your sin. But also his truth. And in his judgment, he judged his son Christ on the cross. And he was just because he punished sin. So we thank the Lord for his mercy and his truth. In Psalm 86 verse 15, the Bible says, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. It's part of who God is. Second of all, mercy and truth marked God's case against his people of Israel. In Hosea, as the prophet Hosea was speaking to Israel and making the case for God against the nation that had sinned against him, he said in chapter 4, verse 1, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. Not only is it part of his character, but it's also part of the reason he had to go against Israel and say, I've got a problem. There's an issue here. There's no truth and there's no mercy. Obviously, many other things could be said about Israel at that time, but there was a lack of mercy and there was a lack of truth. Just number three, and we're going to be done in two points here. We'll get into the message. Mercy and truth purges sin from a life. It has a cleansing or purifying effect. Proverbs 16 and verse 6, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Mercy and truth will do that. It'll do that in the life. It'll cleanse. It'll purify. You want to get an illustration of that cleansing effect, you just need to look at the life of Jacob. Jacob's name meant supplanter. It's one who deceived and he had a bad start because he took the birthright and then he took the blessing. He didn't rely on the Lord to, to let that happen in his life. 
the Lord changed his heart. And when he's coming back to his, his father's house on the way, he, he knows that his brother Esau, who he stole the birthright from, he's on his way to come and meet him. And he's worried, he's afraid, he's scared. So he takes a, a scheme and he puts it together and he says, well, this is what's going to happen. But then the Lord puts him one on one with this, with this um, circumstance where he has to come face to face with who he is. What does God say to him? God, God confronts Jacob and he asks him, who art thou? Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which said unto me, return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. God changed Jacob through his mercy and his truth. And God changed his name from Jacob to Israel, which means prince who has power with God and with man. So mercy and truth go hand in hand. And that's just one example. There's many other examples, no doubt. You go and study that for yourself. But, but just taking that thought, okay, God designed the Bible with intention. He put things in order, not just randomly, right? And now we, know, we just saw an example of mercy and truth, and we traced it for a few passages there. What I'd like to do is I'd like to look at these three things that Christ has done for us in our salvation. But I'd like to use these two names that go together. And there's three examples I'd like to give you. So I'd like to take the truth from the New Testament and illustrate it with the stories from the Old Testament. And we're going to look at this man named Judah and his brother named Benjamin. I'd like you to notice, first of all, with me today that Christ has taken our place. Christ has taken our place. If you'll turn with me, let's go to Genesis chapter 44. Genesis chapter 44. I'd like to give you some context before we read the passage. Genesis chapter 44. So we're going to look at three truths about what Christ has done for us in saving us. And I'd like to take the Old Testament and illustrate that through this man named Judah and his brother Benjamin. Christ has taken our place. Genesis 44 is the story of Joseph. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing story. If you're reading your Bible through this year, you should have already probably finished it in your reading. And uh, obviously you may follow a different uh, chronology or a different way of reading the scriptures, but even the one that we're using with our church, we've read through Genesis already. So this is the story of Joseph. And most of us know the story of Joseph, right? So I don't need to go into too much detail, but just by way of context, uh, years before Joseph's brothers had sold him into slavery. And they did that out of hatred and they did that out of envy. Hatred and envy drove them to do this wicked thing to their brother. And for, as far as they're concerned, they believe Joseph is dead. That's what they think. He, he must be dead. But after a time of testing, Joseph, in fact, has been elevated by the Lord to second in command in the nation of Egypt. So he's second after Pharaoh. God had, God had elevated him. There had been some trials along the way. And now Joseph is at a point in his life where God is using him to save his family from famine. There's a great famine that's in the world. He's going to reveal himself to his brothers who don't know who he is because, again, they thought he must be dead. And, you know, he's grown up in Egypt and he's, he looks like an Egyptian. People think he's an Egyptian. And his brothers have no clue who he is. So that they went down to Egypt and they went and bought food. They went back home and they lived on that food for a, number of, uh, for a number of months. We don't know how long that is. But in process of time, that food was depleted. and It was time to go back to Egypt for more food. But the problem is this, that last time they were in Egypt, Joseph had placed on them this condition. Guys, you're not going to see my face again unless you bring your youngest brother with you. You must bring your youngest brother, otherwise you're not going to see me again. So they know that and they're afraid to bring him because they're so concerned that their father is going to be just grief-stricken that his youngest son is going to leave him and never come back, just like Joseph did. But, but in fact, food drove them to the point that they need to eat. They want to eat, so they're going to go back to Egypt. And so Jacob relinquishes and lets them take, take Benjamin. And so now Joseph has set up this situation where it looks like Benjamin has actually stolen his silver cup. And that was something that Joseph did and he was trying to bring about in them, I believe, a recognition that they'd sinned. He wanted them to understand their sin. I don't understand why he did what he did necessarily, but I believe he was trying to confront them with their sin. 
So they go back to Joseph. They, they've got the silver cup. It, they can't really argue that it was stolen. They, they said they didn't, but it's there in, in Benjamin's sack of, of corn. And what Joseph says to them is, okay, what I'll do is I'll take Benjamin. He'll stay with here with me. And you guys, you boys, you just all go back. Go back to your father. It's okay. I'll let you go. And this is where Judah enters the scene. So look here at chapter 44. And we're going to read from 18 down to 34. It's a long passage, but stay with me. We're here to receive the scriptures this morning. Amen. Amen. Genesis 44, 18. The Bible says, Then Judah came near unto him and said, O my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears. And let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have ye a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one. And his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. And thou saidst unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. And we said unto my Lord, the lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. And thou saidst unto thy servants, Except your youngest brother come down with you, ye shall see my face no more. And it came to pass when we came up unto thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, Go again and buy us a little food. And we said, We cannot go down. If our youngest brother be with us, then will we go down. For we may not see the man's face, except our youngest brother be with us. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, Ye know that my wife bare me two sons. And the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he's torn in pieces, and I saw him not since. And if ye take this also from me, and mischief befall him, ye shall bring down my grey hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life. It shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die. And thy servants shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me, lest peradventure I, sh I see the evil that shall come on my father. Thank you for reading with me. We see here that Judah enters the scene. Judah is like the spokesman for his brethren. And we know that Judah has a significant role later on as the nation where the king would come. But Judah had a had played a key role in getting Joseph down into Egypt. As Judah really had a part in that, a big part in that. It was, in fact, his idea that rather than just killing and murdering Joseph outright, that, hey, let's not kill him. He's our brother, right? Let not our hand be upon him, but let's sell him to these Ishmaelites. Judah was trying to preserve Joseph's life back then. Of course, selling him to the Ishmaelites could be a guarantee of death anyway. As a slave, you don't know what's going to happen. But rather than the, the boys touching their brother, they said, let, let someone else do that. Let's just at least give him that chance. So, so, so Judah had a part in getting Joseph into Egypt. But regardless of the, it was a team effort. Those boys schemed together against their younger brother, Joseph. And it's so sad what they did to him. And, and their actions... And I'm going to say Judah's actions and his deception hurt his father greatly. His father believed that his son Joseph was dead. They, they killed a goat and they sprinkled blood on Joseph's garment of many colors. And they brought it to their father. And, and his father rightly assumed that his son had been killed by a wild beast. And they tried to comfort him, but he couldn't be comforted. Joseph is his beloved son. Judah had a part in that deception. Judah hurt his dad. And then if you read chapter 38 of Genesis, and we're not going to go there, but it's a sad story. If you've read your Bible, it's a sad story of Judah and his family and their failures. Judah writes a sad story in his family's life. Of course, we see God's grace in Judah later on, bringing Jesus Christ through that line. 
But nevertheless, at this point, Judah is just failing. He, he deceives and he sells his brother and then he goes and messes his life up, his family's life. But in spite of all of that, something about Judah has changed, I believe, here in Genesis 44. Judah got to a point where he said, I cannot bear to see my father missing his son Benjamin. So I would rather be in Benjamin's place and stay here in Egypt as a captive to Joseph than rather go home and see my dad and just see the grief that's going to come on him. He's already been so badly hurt with Joseph and the loss and the thing, the thing he thought he was dead and he's going to see Benjamin and Benjamin's also going to be considered as a loss and it's, I, I don't want to see that. I don't want to see my dad go through that. So he said, I will be surety for him. Surety is a key word. Come back with me to chapter uh, 43, if you will. I want to look here in verses 8 and 9. Chapter 43, verses 8 and 9. Judah said unto Israel his father, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and thou and also our little ones. Verse 9. I will be surety for him. Key word. Of my hand shalt thou require him. If I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. What does that word surety mean? I had to go and define it because I, I don't know. So I looked it up. Let me read it to you, okay? And, and just listen. We may need to read it twice just to get the context. The word surety means, all right, in law, one that is bound with and for another. One who enters into a bond to answer for another's appearance in court or for his payment of a debt or for the performance of some act and who, in case of the principal debtor's failure, is compelled to pay the debt or damages. So he's a bondsman. He, he's going to be bail for his brother. Does that make sense? So Judas said, Dad, I'll, I'll, I'll bring him back. And if he doesn't come back, then I'm going to be the surety for him. I'm going to bear the blame. I'm going to fulfill that, okay? I'm going to take the blame for, for them. The Bible also says in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 15, He that is surety for a stranger shall smart for it. And he that hateth shortership is sure. Now I want you to come to Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 22, if you will. Hebrews chapter 7. I told you before that Jesus Christ has taken our place. I'd like to show you how. Hebrews 7 verse 22. You know, Hebrews is about Jesus Christ, talking about how much greater he is than all that the Old Testament could offer. The law, the, the sprinkling of blood and of bulls and of goats, the Old Testament. Christ is so much greater than that. In 7 and verse 22, the Bible says, By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Aren't you thankful that Jesus is the surety of our New Testament? And by the way, the New Testament is established through the blood of the testator, the one who died to establish that covenant. Jesus Christ is our surety, just like Judah was a surety for his brother. What do I mean with this? Well, Christ guarantees our salvation based on what he did at the cross. Amen. He's taken our place. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, just a few pages over. Aren't you thankful that Jesus Christ is that guarantee? He's the one who said, I'll take it. I'll take the blame for them. They're sinners. They can't pay for their own sin. Let me take their place. That's Jesus Christ. He's our great high priest. He's our advocate. He's our surety. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 18. The Bible says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Believer, you deserve to be on that cross. If I can submit to you this morning, I deserve to be on that cross. Jesus Christ took my place. He took your place. He's our surety of the New Testament. He took our place. Praise the Lord. We call this the substitutionary atonement. My sin condemned me to a devil's hell for all of eternity. And I could never pay for my sin. So Jesus Christ took my place. And he went to that cross. He went to that cross for you. 
If you've been saved this morning, it's because he took your place. Isn't that a blessing? Now, let's go ahead and look at another illustration. Go back with me to Judges chapter 20, if you will. We looked at the fact that Christ took our place. And now I'd like to talk about how Christ has dealt with our sin. Christ has dealt with our sin. Judges chapter 20. Again, I want to give you some context um, of the passage, and I think most of us will be familiar. The context is this. The context is, well, you're in the book of Judges, and the book of Judges is all about a, an ongoing and a sad cycle of, of, of blessing for God's people because he prospered his nation greatly. But they got comfortable and complacent with the blessing. And so what they do is they turn away from the Lord and they go and worship idols. And so God has to judge that. He has to punish that. And so he does. And they get brought into bondage, into these nations that take control and bring them into bondage and take them into captivity. And they're in bondage and they cry out to the Lord and the Lord raises up a deliverer. And they get delivered from their bondage. And then they have a season of victory and of blessing and prosperity. But again, they get complacent and the cycle repeats. So that's the context and as far as the book is concerned. The, the description of this time in Israel's history is this. There was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. There was no fear of the Lord in that nation. Amen. Every man just doing what's right. And that's really our society today, is it not? Amen. Every man doing that which was right in his own eyes. And there can be no absolute truth in such a society. And so you choose your own way and it will be okay. But that's wrong because God has absolute truth in the scripture. Amen. He's a God who set the world in existence and it's his prerogative to say, this is the way mankind shall have a relationship with me. But in the context of Judges 19, which is the previous chapter, it's again a sad story. Um, I read it for the, for the message. You don't need to read it now, obviously. <laughs> But let me just talk about the fact that there's immorality in that chapter. And there's a great failing personally. And then there's another great failing with a man and his concubine and these wicked men. This situation comes to the attention of the nation and it shocks the nation. It, it really grieves the nation. So they gather together and they're going to consider the issue and they're going to speak their mind and they're going to give counsel. and They're going to say, what are we going to do about this problem? So they do that and they decide in unity to address the problem. Look at, look at chapter 20 and verse number 8, if you will. Judges 20 verse 8, the Bible says, And all the people arose as one man, saying, We will not any of us go to his tent, neither will we any of us turn into his house. But now this shall be the thing which we will do to Gibeah. We will go up by lot against it. And we will take 10 men of an hundred throughout all the tribes of Israel and an hundred of a thousand and a thousand out of 10,000 to fetch victual for the people that they may do when they come to Gibeah of Benjamin, according to all the folly that they have wrought in Israel. Again, God places words in order in the Bible. I don't know why Gibeah was the place where the sin occurred. I don't know that, why God allowed that. But, but I see a picture here in a second, right? It's in Benjamin. We, we looked at Benjamin before. He, he needed someone to take his place. The fact of the matter is Christ has dealt with our sin. We're going to see Judah deal with Benjamin's sin here. They, they decide to deal with this wickedness, right? In the end of chapter 20 and verse 10, it says, according to all the folly that they have wrought in Israel. The Bible says in Proverbs 26, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. But it also says in the next verse, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. I've read that many times and thought, well, how do you know what to do? I think you need discernment is the answer. Sometimes I believe this is my understanding so far. Maybe I'm not right, but let me give you what I think. Answer a fool according to his folly lest he be wise in his own conceit. There's a case where you need to address a problem and you need to answer a fool and you should not let him continue in that folly. 
But in that preceding verse, it said, don't answer a fool according to his folly, lest you be like unto him. Don't stoop to the arguments and the understanding and the logic of a fool. A fool rejects God's word. Don't do that. If you're going to speak to a fool, speak with the scripture. Speak with the truth. A fool will not do that. Again, that's, I'm not going to be dogmatic about that, but they're dealing with a fool according to their folly. So Israel asks counsel of God and the Lord selects the tribe of Judah to be the one that will lead Israel against Benjamin. Isn't that interesting? You go back to Genesis and you see Judah loving his brother so much that rather than seeing him be kept in slavery in Egypt, that he said, I'll take his place. But you come to Judges and you realize, I'm Judah and now I've got to go and deal with my brother and his sin. And it's going to hurt him very much because he loves his brother. They're a nation, right? They're 12 tribes, 12 sons of the same dad. And he's got to go and deal with Benjamin. Look here in verse 18. The children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God and asked counsel of God and said, which of us shall go up first to the battle against the children of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. And and they do that. Judah leads the nation in going up against Benjamin. And if you continue to read the story here, you'll see two days of great loss in the nation of Israel. The first day they go up against Benjamin. Benjamin has, I think, 26,000 men in total, about 26,000 men, against approximately 400,000 in the nation of Israel. The odds are against Benjamin, but they defeat 22,000 Israelites on that first day. 22,000 men stricken down to the ground and dead in battle. Benjamin seemed really strong. So Israel regroups and they gather themselves together and they they seek the Lord. Of course they weep. They ask counsel of the Lord. Lord, is this right? Should I really be doing this? Look here in... Look here in verse 23. The children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until even and asked counsel of the Lord saying, shall I go up again to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? And the Lord said, go up against him. They've just lost 22,000 men. It doesn't make sense. They're dealing with sin. They lose 22,000 of their own men, good men. So what they do is they regroup and the next day they go out to battle again and they lose 18,000 men. We've lost 40,000 men by now. Is it really worth dealing with that problem of sin? I think God's testing Israel. Are you really in this? Do you really want to deal with the problem? Do you really want to get this dealt with? Put it away from Israel? It's folly what they did in Gibeah. It's wickedness. Are you really willing to go to that extreme length and sacrifice yourself in order to defeat Benjamin and get rid of that sin? Are you willing to do that? So they regroup. It's the second day. They've lost 18,000 men. They regroup, they weep, they sit before the Lord, they fast and they offer offerings and they go back to God and they say, God, should we do it again? And he said, yes, go again. Tomorrow I'm going to deliver them into your hand. So the matter is concluded on that third day. The Lord smites Benjamin before Israel and the tribe is almost entirely destroyed. Only 600 men escape. But God chose Judah to be the one who would lead that attack. Judah and Benjamin. Now let's come back to the New Testament as we consider what Christ did for our sin. God knew that man's biggest problem was his sin, not his health issues, not his financial troubles, not his status in life, but his sin. That's why God sent a savior. The problem is sin and and the, the problem is this, that God is a holy God and he must deal with sin. He must punish our sin cannot allow sin in his presence because he's a holy God. The penalty that he demands is death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So God's plan for dealing with man's sin was to make his sinless son sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21, if you want to turn there, you know the verse, but let's go and look at it once again. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. I'd like to tell you that as Jesus Christ saved you, he dealt with your sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. 
the Bible says, in fact, let's pick it up in verse 19 for just for the completeness. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. And verse 21 is where I want to come to. For he hath made him Jesus to be sin for us, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. The way that God dealt with my sin is He took His Son and He placed my sin on His Son and He punished His Son. Sin for me. God loved mankind so greatly that He gave us the word propitiation to help us understand His love. Propitiation is where wrath, righteous wrath of God must be appeased. And how is that going to be appeased? If you want to go and look with me in 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 10. 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 10. We'll see this word propitiation. First John 4.10 The Bible says, Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So God had a holiness and a righteousness that demanded a righteous payment for sin. And though He desired to show His mercy, He must be true. He must be righteous. He must be just. He must deal with sin appropriately. He cannot just ignore it or brush it under the carpet. He has to deal with it. And so what He he did is He made Jesus Christ to be the propitiation for our sin. So he took his wrath and he placed it on his son. And Jesus Christ died for our sin. The word propitiation means the act of appeasing wrath and conciliating the favor of an offended person. Jesus Christ did that for you and for me. He took God's wrath and he took it upon himself. So now God doesn't have to take his wrath and put it on me. He can put it on his son. He did put it on his son. He judged his son. Sin's now dealt with and he can now offer forgiveness, which is what he did when he saved you. For by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But he's also made him to the propitiation, not just for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. And that's why we come back to 2 Corinthians 5.21 and we need to be ambassadors for Christ. That's what our role is as Christians, ambassadors representing our Savior and this ministry of reconciliation comes into play here where two parties that are at odds can now be brought back together again. That's because the wrath of God was, was satisfied. So we've seen that Christ took our place and we saw that Christ dealt with our sin. And finally today, I'd like you to see that Christ has brought you close to Him. Christ has brought you close to Him. Come with me to 1 Kings chapter 12, if you will. And we'll be done after we get through this point here. 1 Kings chapter 12. Like I said, the Bible is given in order with design. 1 Kings chapter 12. The context of this passage, um, and again, I know you've read the Bible and I know you understand the the scripture. For those who just may need a refresher because we're not reading the whole passage today. The context is this. Under King David, the nation of Israel has been brought together into one nation. The 12 tribes brought together. And he's their king. They're unified together. It's a wonderful situation. He passes away and King Solomon, his son, takes on the throne. And he, and he leads the nation to just its, its zenith, its peak, its power. It's a mighty nation. And they have a peace, a peace and a rest in the land that they could not have under Saul and even under David. And so they build the temple. And they have great glory. And God gives Solomon great wisdom. The nation is elevated. Solomon sinned. Solomon loved many strange women. And they stole his heart and he started worshipping false gods. And God hated that. And so he has to judge that. And we'll come to the passage. But what happened was Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, takes the throne. After Solomon dies and 
the people come to Rehoboam and they give him one request. It's a really simple request. And they, and they say, oh, let's go and have a look here. Um, in verse number 3, 1 Kings 12, verse number 3. That they sent and called him and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke which he put upon us lighter, and we will serve thee. And their dad had pushed them. Solomon had pushed the nation of Israel to a point of weariness and exhaustion. It was not designed to be like that, and, and they're looking for a bit of a break, and it's understandable that they're, they're worn out. They've been serving hard. And they say, they say to his son, just please lighten our load a little bit, and we'll serve you. We're loyal, but please lighten the load. So he sends them away, and he says, come back after three days, I'll, I'll tell you what my answer is. And he goes to the old men, they're wise, they, they knew his father, and he said, what should I do? How shall I answer them? And they said, in verse 7, they spake, and, they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. And that's the key, isn't it? Just some, some meekness, some strength under control. I'm going to answer the people with gentleness. I'm going to give them a lightening of the load. And I'm going to have their loyalty for many, many, many years to come. But for him, he wants to be strong, and he wants to look like he's in control. So he rejects that counsel and he goes to the young men, his friends. By the way, if you're getting counsel, probably a good idea to go to someone who's been down the road ahead and can offer you some wisdom from experience, at the very least experience, but certainly their knowledge and their understanding of the scripture. So just be, just be careful about getting counsel from your peers is what I'd like to say there. But he went to the young men and they recommended a rough answer. Look at verse 10. The young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them. All right, ready, ready Solomon? This is what you should say. This is what we recommend you do. My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. And now whereas my father did laid you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father hath chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. These men are fools. What are they doing? They, they want to give Rehoboam an opportunity to make himself look like a tough, strong, decisive leader. It's foolishness. And Rehoboam really likes that because it makes him look tough and strong and in, in control. So he goes back to the people and he tells them that answer. Verse 15. Wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord, that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake by Ahijah the Shilonite unto Jeroboam the son of Nebat. Verse 16. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to thine own house, O David. So Israel departed unto their tents. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Verse 19. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. And what we see here is we see the separation that God foretold would happen, that 10 tribes would be taken from Solomon because of the sin of Solomon. And only two would be left. To, to Solomon. Come with me to 21. 1 Kings 12, 21. When Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin. Isn't that a blessing? Judah and Benjamin are back here together. And hundred and four score thousand chosen men, which were warriors, to fight against the house of Israel, to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, but the word of God came unto Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and unto all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, ye shall not go up, etc. I'd like to tell you that Jesus Christ has brought us close to him. 
The New Testament truth is pretty simple. Um, if you'd like to go with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We won't be much longer, folks, and we'll, we'll be dismissed. Jesus Christ took our place. He dealt with our sin and he's brought us close. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 13. In fact, let's pick up verse 11 for the context, shall we? Ephesians 2 verse number 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. That's what he's done. He's brought us close. We were once far off. Remember that verse in Proverbs, he that is shorty for a stranger shall smart for it. I'd like to, I've always read that and understood that I need to be careful that who I guarantee myself to, to help. If it's someone I don't know, then I need to be very careful with that. It's going to trouble me. It's going to come around and bite me. I'd like to say this. Judah was a surety for his brother Benjamin. His brother's not a stranger. So it's less of a risk. But Jesus Christ as our surety, and we just read about the word stranger. Hey, he's a surety for you. There's a risk in that, and he did smart for it at the cross. That cross stung our Savior. But we've been made nigh. We've been brought close. You were far off, but now you're made nigh. Isn't that a blessing? We call this reconciliation. Come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I know we were there just a moment ago. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17. Reconciliation. Second Corinthians 5. Sometimes it's just good to go back and look at what Christ did for you. Realize how he saved you and what he did. And not just saved, but he, he substituted himself. And he was a propitiation for our sin. And he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. First Corinthians 5 verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Yeah. Old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Amen. To wit, the God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. God, God reconciled us to him through his son, Jesus Christ. Judah and Benjamin are together at the end there. They're, they're together. And just like that, we also don't just have that reconciliation. We were once enemies of God, but we've been made nigh. Those differences have been dealt with and we're, we're now close to him in a relationship, but it's also fellowship. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, just turn a few pages back. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You know, you didn't just get the barriers taken down, but you brought, you brought in close. You brought into fellowship with Jesus Christ, with your Father in heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You've been not just, you were an enemy and you weren't just reconciled, but God said, hey, I want you to fellowship with me. I want you to fellowship with my son. And that, that's possible through what Christ did. In fact, Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brethren. Come with me to Hebrews chapter two. And this is our last passage today, okay? Hebrews chapter 2. Considering once again Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 2. I want to read from verses 9 down to verse 13. I'll let you get there. We'll finish with this passage. Hebrews 2 verse 9. <clears throat> but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory 
to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified, which is us, we've been sanctified through the blood of Christ, amen, are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. Jesus Christ, not ashamed to call you his brother today. You're, you're brought into the family of God. You've been adopted through the spirit of God. You're the son of God. Not the only begotten son of God, but you are a son of God if you're saved today. Christian, don't forget these things. Um, there are a lot of familiarity that we have over time as we, we're saved for a while, you know. Um, don't, don't forget that Christ took your place. Don't forget that Christ appeased God's wrath. And don't forget that he brought you in close. And if you don't have those three things this morning, and all of this is just academic, it doesn't make sense, then the response is, you need to be saved. Amen. Receive the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But if you do have that, then I... All I would like to say is just encourage you this morning and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for what He did for us. Praise the Lord for His goodness for us. He, he, he took our place. He dealt with my sin. He brought me close to Him. The right response probably includes many things, but it certainly includes praising and thanking Him Amen. for all that He's done. And, and secondly, just living our lives in light of what He did. And part of what we have to do as Christians is be a, an ambassador of Christ, for Christ. But if you're not saved, then you need to take a seat with Benjamin and realize you need some help. And I say that in love, but you do need some help. Because without Christ, you will be on your way to eternity without the Lord. And that's a fearful place. It's the lake of fire, which is the second death. You need to be born again. You must be born again. All right, let's pray, shall we? Our Father, we thank you for the work of Christ. It's a blessing to be saved. It's a blessing to have a home in heaven. Thank you that Christ did it all for us. Thank you for the example of Judah and Benjamin. I know, I know it's a simple thought this morning, Father, but I pray that your people might come away encouraged. Thank you that Christ took our place. Thank you, Lord, that he was our substitution. Thank you, Lord, that he is the propitiation for our sins, that he took your wrath and directed it away from us where it rightly belonged, and he put it on himself. And thank you, Lord, that we're not just forgiven of our sin, but we're brought into a fellowship as part of the family of God. Yeah. And I pray that you'd help us to realize this and to take hold on this and to not count our salvation a minor thing or a small matter, but to realize we've been delivered, we've been saved, and it's a blessing to be saved. So Lord, we thank you and we praise you. And if there's someone here this morning who is not saved, does not understand this message, our prayer and your desire, Lord, is that they would be saved. And we pray that there will be conviction today and a clarity that may be brought in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.